today as we come to the table. There's an insidious way that Satan has used this in recent church generations where people say, well, until I learn to love myself, I can't love anybody else. You know what that does? That puts you on the sideline and gets you out of the game until you figure it out. You're non-usable. You're stuck over there going, how can I figure it out? For whatever weeks of class you're taking or how many books you want to read, and then maybe sometime down the road you think, okay, now I do enough, I can get back in. The Lord said, you do this today. Today you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Don't wait. Don't put that off. Don't, don't pretend that some of the thing. Do what I ask you to do. And by the way, the answer to depression and self-worry and all these things about self is focusing on others. That is the answer. Do you know what every one of us is probably guilty of? Not feeling qualified. And then what do we do? We figure out a way to learn, practice, get training, and become more qualified. And that, in itself, is an honorable and commendable thing. But sometimes we might continue down the path of learning and reading and studying while never actually transferring the book knowledge into action. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table the Daily Bible Study Program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. As Pastor Mark teaches today, living out the actions of love and prayer is so important. God says, do this today. Start where you are. He'll be with you. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, as he continues his message, Silencing His Enemies. Jesus will meet us wherever we are, and we need to be well-versed enough in the Bible to meet everyone else where they are. Because you're going to run into people that say, well, I don't believe that part of the Bible. Well, I don't believe that. Well, I don't believe that. You need to be able to go to some part of the Bible they do believe. My question is, well, what do you believe in the Bible? Well, I believe that. Well, then let's go there. You need to know the Word of God good enough to do that. Now, for the Gentile, if they say they believe the New Testament, you're, go to the New Testament. It's full of the gospel, Right. But you run into a Jew and they say, well, we don't believe the New Testament, only the Old Testament. You need to know the Old Testament good enough to go to them and say, all right, well, let me show you this right here. Genesis 22, and let's watch Abraham the father take his son to sacrifice his only son to Mount Moriah, which, by the way, is the Temple Mount and the very same place that Jesus died on the cross. And in his place as a substitute, there was a lamb who had its horns caught in a thorn bush, if you will, crown of thorns on this thing. He got it, he tied it up, he sacrificed it in place of his son, even as God's son is in our place. The gospel's all through the Bible. But if we don't know the Bible good enough and we don't know where to take people to show that in the Bible to them, we're not going to be able to do that. So we need to be students of the word all of it and be ready guys especially in the days in which we live well Jesus obviously was not only a student of the word he was the word and so again he silences them in their very own scriptures in the place that they do believe and so now number two group is set to the side if you will in examining the lamb and finding him spotless now we move to group number three today and that is the scribes look at verse 34 but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees they gathered together again plan b right and then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, some, several things we need to note here. First of all, who were these lawyers? Who were these scribes? They weren't lawyers like we think of today, like you go and you hire someone for your case or whatever you need. No, they were experts in the law of God. So experts in the Bible. They were, they were, they were biblical scholars. Now, the Pharisees prided themselves in their Bible knowledge. The Sadducees did in the first five books, prided themselves of their knowledge. But these were the big guns. If you really need to settle something, you would go to the scribes. And why? Because they not only knew the Bible and studied it like the Pharisees and Sadducees, but they wrote it out. Whenever there needed to be a new scroll, it was the scribes who wrote the Word of God out. So not only did they study it, they were writing it and driving it deep into their mind and deep into their heart, which again shows you that you can know a lot of the Bible and still not know God. That's kind of scary, isn't it? 
And maybe you know people like that. I, I, I knew of one man who knew over 1,200 verses in the Bible. He, he's been since saved, and now he uses that as part of his testimony. He said, I could quote huge portions of the Bible. I memorized it like crazy. He said, but I didn't know God. Again, this was the scribe. This is what they were like. And so again, they come to him, they get the scribe there, and notice the scribe, this expert now, the, the last chance they have of getting him, which is the greatest commandment. Now know this, what they would do is, is these scribes and these Pharisees and all these the Sadducees, they'd sit around like, like Bible professors in a Bible college or maybe students at a seminary, and they'd talk about all these subjects they were trying to work out, and they'd argue about these things. Well, the one they would argue about is, which is the greatest commandment? They, they recognized 613 commandments in the Old Testament. And so they would take those commandments and say, now, which one's the greatest? How do these rank? And, and really to the point, they would even get down where if, if you got far enough down the line, it didn't really matter about them. You kind of let them go. That one's got number 535. Who really cares? 613, don't even pay attention to it. What are the important ones? They're missing the whole point. The point is, obey the Word of God. There is no such thing as a small commandment. There's no such thing as something trivial. And by the way, guys, note this. This is good. You're going to find this true in your life. If you're faithful in the small things, then God can use you in greater but if you're not faithful in the small things, God will never use you in the greater. So never think of it as, you know, which law, which things should I obey, which things should I not obey. However, there are some that are greater than others. And this particular one, they're arguing about which is the greatest commandment. Maybe they can trip Jesus up. Maybe they can divide his people by a disagreement on which law was greater because of all their uh, theological arguments they would have. And Jesus said to them, again, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Notice this. This is the first and great commandment. He lays a foundation. He says, there is no thing greater you can do than put God above everything. And not only putting God above everything, you love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, every bit of you. You need to give everything to God. If you do that, you have the first and the greatest commandment in place. This is what they call the Shema. They still quote it today. The Jews do. And so, again, that's the foundation that's laid. And that's important leading into the second one. Notice this. He gives them a bonus point. They didn't ask for the second one, but he throws a bonus point in. He says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Look how easy God has made obeying the word of God. Now, I understand it's by the Spirit, and it's not that easy. We have to walk in the Spirit. I get all that, the struggles. But he summed it all up by saying this, look, people say, the Bible, there's too much, there's so much you have to, how could I ever? He said, just do this. Love God with all you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else falls into place. Take any law from the Bible, take any example and, and put it through that filter and see if it doesn't come out that way. Thou shalt not murder. If I love God first, I'm not going to kill you, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. If I love God first, I'm not going to try to take your wife. Thou shalt not steal. If I love you, I'm not going to try to you know, take your money or other things from you. It's a natural result, which means if you just do the basics, everything else is taken care of. Now, it's only done by the power of the Spirit. I know that, but it's the basics. Now, the second one that he throws in, I think, is one that's been misunderstood and misapplied, I think more so in recent years than other years, and that is he says, love your neighbor as yourself. What the Lord is saying is we all love ourselves, so try loving your neighbor that way. Now, again, for some of you, you might hear that and say, wait a minute, I, I don't know. I've always heard that I have to love myself first. That's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what the Lord is teaching here. The Lord is not saying that we have to learn to love ourselves so we can love other people. We naturally love ourselves. Again, an example I use on a regular basis, but it just works so good. You've probably heard it. Bear with me. If I took a snapshot of all of us right now and hung it up in the hall for the next month for everyone to see who's coming to third service, when you went out there to see the big printout, who's the first person you would look for? And probably, if you're like me, you'd be going, oh, man, why was I wearing that? Or can we take it again? Can we read? You know, you know why? Because I'm worried about you? Who am I worried about? I was blinking. Do it again. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to redo a picture if you're blinking. <laughs> I'm making a point. Our focus is on ourself. And we don't realize how much we're focused on ourselves. We're concerned about self. So the Lord's argument here is not you need to learn to love yourself. He's saying, you already do love yourself. You need to learn to love others. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 5.29. For no one ever hated his own flesh. You could put a period there and just meditate for a week on that. No one. But nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. And so God's battle with us is not to try to get us to love ourselves. God's battle with us is to get us to love other people. 
And you say, but what about I, I hate myself? And what about people that take their own life and have great depression? Oh, listen, every bit of that, as hard of a subject as that is, it's all rooted in self. And what do I mean by that? The person that's depressed or the person that says, I don't want to live any longer, why is that? It's because they're so upset about their life. I'm not depressed about how bad it's going for you. I'm not concerned about wanting to live because you're having a hard time. Those are the battles that I have because it's about me. It's about me. It all comes back to self. That doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean we don't show compassion. It just means we have to understand the root and what's happening. Because I bring that up because there's an insidious way that Satan has used this in recent church generations where people say, well, until I learn to love myself, I can't love anybody else. You know what that does? That puts you on the sideline and gets you out of the game until you figure it out. You're non-usable. You're stuck over there going, how can I figure it out for whatever weeks of class you're taking or how many books you want to read? And then maybe sometime down the road you think, okay, now I do enough, I can get back in. The Lord said, you do this today. Today you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Don't wait. Don't put that off. Don't, don't pretend that some of the thing, do what I ask you to do. And by the way, the answer to depression and self-worry and all these things about self is focusing on others. That is the answer because it gets our eyes off of ourself and it turns our eyes to others. And if you're fighting with depression, if you're fighting with not wanting to live, and there may be somebody in there, I don't take this lightly. There may be somebody in here contemplating taking their own life. Listen, turn your eyes to the Lord and begin to serve Him and serve others and give God an opportunity to show you the joy that comes from following Him and pouring yourself into others. That's the answer. And so, again, don't let anyone use this in the wrong way. And also, don't let it be used. This verse has also been used recently, I think, in, in, in kind of a manipulation way in some of the current events that are happening in our culture. Listen, God said this, you put God first. What comes second? Your neighbor. Now, hear me on this. That doesn't mean that we don't die to ourselves for our neighbor's sake. That doesn't mean that we don't love our neighbor. Yes, of course, it's the second greatest command. But there are those that will try to manipulate you to put your neighbor first over God. I've had people share with me, hey, God gave me a conviction. I know this is from the Lord. And they get pressure either from other Christians or other friends. And in some cases, maybe even political figures or the government saying, if you don't do this, you're not loving your neighbor. Guys, that's manipulation. And that's making the government and your neighbor God. It's putting them first in your life. God said this, no, 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 no. I'm first. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. You listen to me. And if I tell you to do something that's contrary, even if the world's trying to manipulate my word to make you feel guilty, you listen to me, you do what I've told you to do, and then after that, now you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And again, I bring this up because in the last days, I think we're going to see a lot more pressure of this, a lot more implication of this. Guys, listen, a little bit of prophecy moment here. I have a prophecy moment, we'll get back to this. I want you guys to be prophecy literate, and recognize with your spiritual glasses what's going on and be able to recognize these things. That's why I bring it up. Because I think we can make a mistake of trying to be first and foremost politically minded and then work it into the spiritual realm. That's not how it works. Everything is in the spiritual realm and whatever comes down to the political realm comes down from the spiritual realm. Let me give you an example. Picture in your mind a circle around the earth. That's God. God is over, over the entire earth. He's the Lord of all. He's over all things. But then in the next layer down is Satan and the demonic realm. And God allows them certain freedom, certain levity, the ability to do certain things. God allows that for his purposes. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world, small g, okay? Second uh, Corinthians uh, speaks of that. And so we recognize that. Now, he doesn't rule over us. God rules over us. But the Bible says in 1 John that he blinds the world, that they can't see what he's doing. Satan will use his spirit to affect world politics, so this is where we have to be so wise as believers. If we just jump into the political realm and start throwing punches, we will be defeated. We're not greater than Satan. And we're not going to be able to defeat Satan by the political realm. We have to stay in the spiritual realm, which is above that. And then we recognize from the spiritual realm, it moves into the political. And when God moves in our heart, maybe to make a stand or to call a congressman or senator or do whatever God wants us to do, there are all those cases we do. That. There's nothing wrong in that. That's taking action as God leads, but it's the proper understanding and it's the proper balance. Now, why do I say that? Because, again, I think we're going to see more of this type of verse being used against us very, in the very near future. You've heard me talk about the World Economic Forum. 
The World Economic Forum is a group of leaders from around the world. America is very involved. They're meeting in Davos, Switzerland. They meet there every year in Davos, Switzerland, this beautiful, ritzy place where they all gather, this kind of thing. And they talk about how the world is going to have its direction. They're trying to mold the direction of the entire world. And they're very openly talking about the one world government, the one world this, the one world that. They want everything to be centrally located, right, as far as the governmental control. Maybe you don't know this. Maybe you do know this. Our particular government right now has given permission to these guys to take our health issues in America and come under the WHO, which is an international community. Now, by the way, 194 nations, including America, are going to be saying to the World Health Organization, if you want to call a pandemic, you have the authority over America. If you want to call a lockdown, you have the authority over America. If you want to call for whatever, you have authority over America. You now have that. You can do that. We're ceding that authority over our Constitution to you. Now, again, there's, I think, something like six months if the senators and congressmen get involved to stop it. But that's where we are. But I want you to recognize, not from the political. I only say what's happening in the earthly political to make you recognize, where is this coming from? That, guys, the Bible said in the last days, Satan's spirit will move the world to come under one government controlled by a centralized controlling system. That is what's happening right now with the World Economic Forum. So you need to recognize this is something spiritual. It's something happening. Now, why am I telling you this? I don't want to freak you out and make you panic or worry or whatever the thing. I'm certainly not trying to you know, raise up some kind of political uprising. That's not my heart at all in this. My heart is simply this. We as believers need to know the Bible good enough to recognize when things are manifesting themselves in the earthly and political realm, what's really going on in the spirit realm. This is much higher than man. This is much higher than our government, than any president, any leader. This is something that God told us is going to happen, and we need to recognize it. Well, Mark, why would you tell us this? It makes me worry. Look, if your house is in the valley and the dam's about to break, you're going to be glad that somebody shows up on the door and says, hey, this place is going to be flooded soon. Let's go to higher ground. Guys, Jesus Christ is the higher ground. And now we move to higher ground with Jesus Christ. So we need to get our eyes on him. We need to focus on him. We need to recognize that he's the one in control. By the way, I say this because... There's going to be another tactic the enemy has used and will use again, and that is fear. This is a worldwide spiritual move. You have to recognize a Satan of the demonic realm organizing the world and giving over sovereignties as we speak, organizing something else to bring fear, organizing another group to give power over us. Now, if we didn't know what the outcome was, that would be pretty freaky. But here's what we do know. At the right time, the trumpet's going to sound and Jesus Christ is going to take his people out of here. And we're going to be watching it from the bleacher seats. And here's what I know. Until that happens, he's going to be our strength. He's going to be our Lord. He's going to be our hope. He's going to be our power. He, even as he outwitted all of these guys, he's going to give us wisdom beyond ourselves to outwit these guys. And so we trust the Lord. I only say this to say, don't live by fear. God knew you'd be alive in the last days. He said in the last days, you'd see multiple plagues. Okay, they're happening. He told us. He let us know in advance. The world doesn't know it all. They said, oh, what's happening? We recognize it. It doesn't mean we don't recognize real illness. It doesn't mean we don't have our own battles as far as, you know, nobody wants to get sick, etc. But fear is a great motivator. He's going to use it to motivate the world in the direction that he wants it to go. Yeah, he'll get, let politics do their little thing. They're, they're pawns. But Satan, the demonic realm, is going to use this, and he's going to try to mold the world the way he wants through this. You as believers, don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. And here's the other thing. Did the Lord know? And I've told you this before. Again, I think about Peter when he said, it's not tedious to me to tell you the same things over and over. It might be tedious to those that have known me for a long time, but not to you guys. <laughs> Understand this. Jesus said, in the last days, all these things are going to happen. And then the Spirit of God spoke through the writer of the Bible to say, in the last days, it said this, look, don't forsake the assembling together of the believers. Now get this, especially as you see the day of the Lord approaching. What he's saying is this, there's going to be things happening in the last days that are going to try to keep you from going to church. There's going to be things in the last days that are, that are going to try to make you afraid. And they're going to make you hide and run and cover yourself over with whatever. Don't do it. You're my family. I've let you know. I've told you that I'll protect you. I have a plan. I haven't forgotten you. You're my bride. I love my bride. And I'm going to take care of my bride. So if something comes through about... Look, what you do as far as your health should be your choice. But if a new shot comes through and you better do this because monkeypox or whatever, and I think it's going to be one thing after another after another, it is not unloving to your neighbor to listen to God first. God, you tell me what to do. If you say do it, I'm going to do it. I'll take it. If you say no, I'm not going to. 
but I'm going to listen to your voice. And that is not unloving. That's called obedience to God Almighty. So be aware of that. And so again, now he silences these guys and of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The scribes, again, themselves now, nobody can take the Lord and find any blemish or spot. Now we come to the last thing today, and that is, uh, again, the Lord revealing who the Messiah really is. In this day, they believed that the Messiah was only a man, that he wasn't God, and the Lord's going to show them, indeed, the Messiah is God. Look at verse 41. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? <laughs> In other words, I know you think he's a man. But I'm going to show you he's greater than men. Now, why would the Lord ask this? Understand, look at their answer. They said to him, the son of David. That is, he's just a man. He came through the line of David. Now, the way the Jews looked at things in that day was, is whoever was the father was the greater. So the father would have been the Lord of the family. Now, we think about Lord only pertaining to God in these days. But again, this would be a situation of the master of the family. And then the children will be under that. So the implication by saying son of David is, David is greater in some way as the father. The lineage, the Messiah is also a man, not as great as David, but he's the Savior in a different way. And that's the way they looked at it. He's going to show them, no, you don't understand. He was way before David. Look what he said in verse 43. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call the Messiah? Because they all knew this was a messianic verse. Call him Lord. Or, uh, saying, the Lord said to my Lord. And by the way, that's Yahweh. That would be the word we'd translate Jehovah. Jehovah, that is the Father God said to the Messiah. Would be the, the literal translation of this. The, the Father God said to the Messiah, which is my Lord. He's above me. David's saying he's above me. I'm not above him. He's greater than I am. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Remember the Lord sat down at the right hand of the Father. What he's saying is, he's not lesser than David, he's greater than David. And not only that, if he's before David, that means he's eternal. Because he's born as a man afterwards. We're not talking about a normal man, we're talking about God. If David then calls him Lord, how then is he his son? Wow, just I love the wisdom. And look at this, no one was able to answer him a word. He shut them down nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. It's like, I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm not going to be humiliated. I'm done, right? Why? Because he's our spotless lamb. The question is, is he your spotless lamb? Is he your spotless lamb? Have you confessed your sin? Have you put your trust in the Lord? Listen, with all we see going on in the world today, watching prophecy come to pass before our very eyes, we need a Savior more than ever. Now, we always need a Savior. We need to be saved from our sin. The Bible says we're all born in sin, and the only way our sins can be taken care of is by having somebody pay that bill. Jesus is the only one that did it through the cross, His blood. But the reality is, is that we need Him even more now. I think not just the Savior of our soul, but the Savior of the day. We need wisdom from God. We need direction from God. You need to make Jesus your Savior. And so again, if you don't know the Lord, I invite you to make that commitment today. Confess your sin, believe that He died for you on the cross, and receive Him. But then I'm going to pray over all of us that we would be filled with the Spirit of God for wisdom in the days we live. Listen, in the Lord's day, there were a lot of smart men. They weren't nearly as smart as the Lord. They thought they were smart, trying to trap Him, and He gave them the wisdom He needed to make it stand for God. We need that same wisdom today. There's going to be a lot of people around us trying to trap us for our stand and what we believe and standing on the Word of God and why aren't we afraid and why aren't we doing this and why don't we do that? And then we're going to point back to the Word of God because that's what God told us to do. But that's supernatural. We need the power of God to do that. I need it. You need it. Well, our time at the table of God's Word has come to a close for today. But seize this moment to draw closer to Jesus right now. Will you come and sit at the teacher's feet with us? You know, Matthew was close to Jesus. He actually walked with him, talked with him, ate with him, and traveled with him. And in this verse-by-verse -verse series through the Gospel of Matthew, Pastor Mark is taking us up close and personal with Jesus and the disciples who followed him. And together, we'll see Jesus tell stories, perform miracles, astound the people, and frustrate the religious leaders. We'll witness Jesus dying on the cross, experience the despair and fear the disciples felt that day too, and then we'll see Him rise triumphantly from the grave. To listen again or share with a friend today's message, along with many others, can be found at thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net. Once you're there, you simply need to click on the Come to the Table tab. Listen. We'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link or call us at 865-609-1385.
That's 865-609-1385. Please don't hesitate to reach out and make sure you're staying grounded in God's Word by reading the Bible every day. Allow Jesus to grow you as you draw close to Him daily and be willing to go where He's guiding you. Pastor Mark has prepared our next verse-by-verse -verse review of the book of Matthew. So put your bookmark there and make sure to join us here the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.